Good afternoon, my blessed friends. It's great to see you. Our day outdoors is just fabulous today. Sunlight, enough sunlight to fill your soul. And blue sky, a few little fluffy white clouds. But it is windy. <laughs> so you should have seen me all dressed up to preach on the street with a great puffy coat and a black scarf and black earmuffs and black gloves even. But God blessed. So I'm delighted to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. We are working through the Bible. We've done the Pentateuch at least. And then last week, Joshua. Um, we're going to read from Judges today. If you want to get out your Bible and follow along, that's fine. Judges 7, verses 2 through 7, and Judges, oh, it's in the same chapter, 16 to 22. Then we're going over to Judges 21. But before we read, let's pray. Most Holy Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful for the things you have made, the beautiful creation outdoors. We honor you and glorify you as the one who made and therefore has dominion over all here on earth. And we ask for your blessing as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So here is Judges 7, starting with verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, because of this, go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there remained, the return of the people, 22,000. There remained only 10,000. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water and I will try them for you there. And it will be that of whom I say to you, this will go with you the same will go with you. And of whomsoever I say to you, this will not go with you, the same will not go. So he brought down the people to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone that laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, that is get right down in the water, that's the one you will set by himself. Everyone who bows down on his knees to drink. Mm, I had it backwards. You set them apart. The one who laps it with their tongue, like this, is in one place. And everyone who gets down on his knees in the water to drink is in another place. The number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees full face in, to drink the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped the water, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go every man to his place. There's a little farther on in the story, verse 16. And he, Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said to them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it will be that as I do, you will do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then you blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp of the enemy. And say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came onto the outside of the camp. 
in the beginning of the middle watch, middle of the night, and they had but newly set the watch. <coughs> Gideon's people blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands, so all the light shone out, and the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the lamps, oh, the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place around the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew their trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host of the enemy, and the host fled. And here's at the very end of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So the title of our little meditation today is A Nation Led by Judges. I imagine we could think that being led by judges, it would be a very fair place to be. But let's notice some things about it. We are preaching through the Bible. We have so far examined the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, the story of beginnings, claiming that God created everything. Last time we heard about Joshua adding the beginnings of Israel in the land of Israel. Today we look at the seventh book, Judges, sometimes said to have been written by Samuel, who has his own two books not far ahead of us. The book of Judges is a collection of stories about life in Israel after Joshua died and before there was a king. God called specific people to do specific tasks to protect or judge his people. There are 12 of these judges who led Israel in this way. You might recognize some of them. Today, we will have time for only one, Gideon. Then we'll talk about two of the themes in the book of Judges. So here's the story of Gideon. The Midianites had discovered a source of free and abundant food. In harvest season, they would go over to Israel and eat or destroy all the crops they found. The people called on the Lord, and the Lord called Gideon. And Gideon put out a call for warriors. They came, 32,000 of them, to fight for their freedom and their families' food against multitudes without number of the Midianites. The Lord said, hmm, the troops with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Israel would only take the credit away from me, saying, my own hand has delivered me. They kept only those showing an alertness and eagerness to fight this battle. 300 in the final count. Gideon supplied each man with a torch and a clay jar to cover it in one hand, and a trumpet in the other hand. He made them into three companies, each finding a position on one of the hills surrounding the enemy camp. At one command, they broke the clay jars to let light shine, and they blew the trumpets. No sword or bow was needed. The enemy soldiers woke with a start, saw three hundred commanders on the hillsides, imagined how many swordsmen and bowmen there would be with each commander, and they killed each other in fright. Oh, the eager Israelite soldiers did do some killing that day, but it was not needed. I will tell you about priests and prophets during the time of the judges. Yes, the tent of meeting which Israel had made at Mount Sinai stood at Shiloh. And there were priests who tried to keep the lights lit and the fires burning. 
The people of Israel, however, had fallen off in their tithes and offerings by which the Levites, the priestly tribe, made their living. Many of the priests went out hunting other work. One Levite found work with a man named Micah as his private priest for the family. There are two prophets mentioned in the book of Judges. Deborah was a prophet and a judge. In the story of Gideon, an unnamed prophet appeared to Israel before Gideon was called to remind the people of God's early dealings with them and that they had not obeyed God. Priests and prophets during the time of the judges. But one theme that rings clearly through the books through the book of judges is that there was no king in Israel. In those days, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I believe what God wanted, according to Moses' instructions in the middle of Deuteronomy, was this to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. We will find that whether or not they were settled in the land, whether or not they had a king, they often forgot to consider what would be right in the eyes of the Lord. Judges is a book of cautionary tales. The question for us is, will I stop my own rightness in my own eyes long enough to consider what would be right in the eyes of the Lord? Will you? I do have a question for you to ponder and think about. Somehow I can't turn the page right now. There we go. Just a short question. Which is better, kingly leadership or freedom for the rising of local leadership? There are some people who really denigrate the time of the judges because the people were just hither and thither. But then when Samuel, the last of the judges, was asked to get a king for them, Samuel reminded them of all the troubles of a king. So which would you rather live under? A king? Like David, Solomon, Hezekiah? Or would you rather live in a place where there really was no king and violence could happen Yet, there was room for local leadership to come in like Gideon and make a way for God's people. That's just a thought question. Next week, what comes after Judges? Ruth. We'll spend a little bit of time with a, a pleasant little book. Not everything in it was pleasant, however. But the story is one that we often use in pleasant situations. I wish you'd get out your prayer requests. And we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for the stories even though there are stories from back then that really trouble us. We wonder how could there be such violence in your book, in your land. And then we look around at the violence of our land and we're ready to repent. So we thank you, we honor and glorify you as the one who has the power and the right, the authority to make your kingdom come on earth. 
And we come in repentance, confession, because so often we want to take things into our own hands. We want to do what is right in our own eyes. We confess how often we have hurt one another in these efforts. We believe that you sent Jesus on the cross to buy our forgiveness. And so as we're asking for it now, we thank you and we receive your forgiveness at this moment. We brace you for this. And in the joy of that forgiveness, we bring you our prayer requests. Knowing that you've been considering them already. Because you know what we need before we even ask. Lord, there are folk we know who are ill. Or going for tests. Having troubles with their health of some kind. You know who they are. We ask for your continued care. For our health and the health of those we love. We know there are some struggling with financial issues. Food insecurity, housing vehicle insecurity. You know how to deal with those. Lord, we ask that you will connect your people with your resources. We ask that you please bless those who are our friends but are far away or estranged nearby. You know how to heal relationships. And that's what we ask for. You know our children, every one of them and their struggles, whether it be at school, with schoolwork or with other kids or uh, with their own struggles at home. I ask that you please bless our kids. Make our children know you. Let them see your love in us. And Lord, we, we turn our thoughts to larger things. There are our streets, our cities, our nation and nations for whom we pray that your kingdom will come. You know the decisions being made today, this very moment, in some rooms that will the decisions will affect lives forever. I ask for your wisdom, your guidance in these rooms where decisions are being made, that they may be made in ways that will open ways for you to bring your kingdom here on earth that your will may be done here on earth. We honor you and praise you for that. And we ask also for your comfort and uh, resources for those who are affected by tornadoes, floods, fires, earthquakes, volcanoes, and other natural acts. We sometimes call them acts of God. We know that you can comfort and guide. That you have all the resources needed for rebuilding at any time of our lives. So we're trusting you. We turn to you. We will honor and praise and glorify your name forever. You are the only one who has the authority to have a righteous dominion. To be a king who makes gracious judgment fair and true. We honor you and praise you. We will through all eternity. And we've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm Wilma Zollabach. And I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship. And uh, I'd love to hear back from any of you. You can... Actually, you can leave a message on this YouTube uh, channel if you want to. Um, or some of you may know my email address, and I'm happy to hear back from you. So 
the Grace Chapel Fellowship is a, a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity. And yes, I have six themes that you'll hear over and over and over again in my preaching. One, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, God can, I can't, and I decide to let God. And then there's number five, the Bible is worth reading. And number six, the seventh day Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So next week, I will look forward to seeing you again. And until then, may God bless you and keep you.